Thank you, Michael. It's good to have Michael with us this morning in Janet's absence. Let me draw your attention to a few of the announcements we have in our bulletin. First of all, please notice that in two, uh, three weeks will be our graduate recognition. Excuse me, two weeks. I was right the first time. Two weeks is our graduate recognition. If you have a child uh, that is graduating from college or high school and you've not contacted the church office, we need to know about that this week so we can make plans to honor them on the, last, uh, on the 24th of this month. So please make note of that announcement. Also, this Wednesday, we have a couple of special meetings. Wednesday, May 13th, there's the meeting for the Massachusetts Mission Trip at 5 o'clock. And then at 6 o'clock is our regularly monthly business meeting with a meal. This is the last uh, meeting that we have with a meal. Uh, during the summer, we just have dessert. We go a little lighter in the summer. And so this is a wonderful time of fellowship. And at this business meeting, we'll be electing our nominating committee. So it's an important meeting, and I encourage you to be here this coming Wednesday evening. You see the other announcements. Uh, remember our men's brotherhood uh, fish fry on May 18th. Put that on your calendar, men. That's uh, the last meeting for this church year. They'll take a break during the summer. So many of our programs are coming to, a, uh, to an end this, this month as we look into the summer and our schedule becomes a little lighter. But please make note of all the announcements that you find uh, in your bulletin. We're glad that you're here this morning. We're especially glad to have you if you're one of our guests. This is a wonderful day for us. Not only is it Mother's Day, and we're glad to honor those women in our church who are uh, mothers and who are, have been individuals of great influence on our lives, but also today is the day we have chosen to rededicate our sanctuary after all the hard work that the committees have, have done and all the renovations that have occurred. And so I'm glad you're here on this very historic day. If you're one of our guests, we encourage you to fill out the visitor's card that you have uh, attached to your bulletin and to put it in the offering plate a little later in the service so we can have a record of your time with us. And we're going to ask our members to stand and greet you and to greet one another, and then we're going to join together and sing our fellowship chorus, number 22, Bless His Holy Name. Let's stand and greet one another. worship comes from the psalm psalm 100 shout for joy to the lord all the earth worship the lord with gladness come before him with joyful songs know that the lord is god it is he who made us and we are his we are his people the sheep of his pasture enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise give thanks to him and praise his name for the lord is good and his love endures forever his faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's remain standing and praise the Lord by singing our opening hymn. Hymn 392, Stir Your Church, O God and Father.
May we pray together? God, what a good and wondrous God you are. We thank you for our mothers that gave birth to us and gave us life throughout our years of growing up, for our grandmothers and all of those women who have been a part of nurturing us physically and spiritually and helping us to grow up in our faith. Lord, we also thank you for this great day when we celebrate the past and the present and the future of this church. God, we thank you for the blessings that you have given to us and the, the ministry that has been done here throughout the years. We thank you for what you are doing in our midst right now and for what you will continue to do in this ch church in the future. Lord, we recognize that we are not perfect, that we are not perfect people and that we are not perfect as a church, but that through your grace, we can become perfect and we can minister in your name. We thank you for these blessings and for these promises. And we pray as your son taught his disciples, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We enter into a time this morning during our worship service when we're going to have some special recognitions and also some reflection on our past and our present and looking to our future. I've asked a couple of our church leaders to come and share with you a little bit of our past and also uh, the process that's brought us to this point. And so I'm going to ask Gene and Sarah if they'll come now and share with you some of the history of our church and of this project that we have completed. In Proverbs, we read, where there is no vision, the people perish. Our vision began in 1889. At that time, there were no permanent buildings, sidewalks, or streets in Middlesbrough. People were just beginning to settle here. But in that year, eight churches were founded. On September the 23rd, at, in 1889, at 7.30 in the evening at the office of Judge J.R. Uh, Samson, 11 people, men and women, met for the purpose of organizing First Baptist Church. Of those 11 people who attended, 10 became charter members. The next month, a contract was signed for a new wooden building to be built down on the corner of 20th Street and Chester Avenue. It's where Schneider's uh, Restaurant is now. And the, it was completed uh, in March of 1890 and cost $920. Uh, the first addition to the original building was a baptistry constructed in November of that year. And electric lights were installed at the same time. And one month later, in December, a coal furnace was purchased. In 1908, an annex was added to this wooden building and that was the place where the men's Baraka class met. It began in that year. Other building improvements in 1908 included a new roof, carpet, wallpaper, refinishing the pews, and enlarging the choir space. A committee was appointed in 1912 to investigate the possibility or the feasibility of purchasing a lot for a new building. After two months, the committee reported back that they had found a lot. And it's this one where we are today, on 23rd in Cumberland. The lot was purchased on March the 5th, 1913. An architect was employed the next year to draft plans for the new church building, and the deacons were appointed as the building committee. Dr. Roddy was chairman or was pastor of the church at that time and he is the one who designed 
this beautiful sanctuary where we are today. Dr. Roddy preached the dedication service on March the 17th, 1917. But before that sermon, there was a march from the old church on Chester Avenue into this building. Three of our people who are here today were in that march, and I'm going to ask that they stand at this time. Lucille Adams, Elsie Elliott, and Olive Crockett. While they're standing, is there anyone else? Is there anyone? Thank you. Is there anyone else who marched that day? Thank you. Now, the building was completed in 1917, and it was paid for in full in 1920. Other additions have been made to the church. The first educational building, which consists of today's TEL chapel and the gym, was completed in 1929. The new educational building was finished in 1965. Our church has gone through a lot of st uh, stages of renovation. In this sanctuary, many changes have been made. The first one that we know of was that a heater was added to the baptistry in 1924. In 1949, there was major renovation. The pulpit was enlarged, and the baptistry was raised up to where it is today. Before that time, the choir was up there, and the baptistry was down low. New pulpit uh, furniture was, uh, was purchased at that time, too. And then in 1966, there was another major renovation. At this time, new carpet and pews were purchased. Money from the church building fund was used to provide new lighting for the sanctuary. And the sanctuary was air conditioned in 1968. Reversible pew cushions were added in 1977. A new public address system was installed in 1986. On February the 11th, 1987, our pastor, Bill Daniel, appointed members of the Long-Term Planning Committee and charged them with the responsibility to study the needs of the church and the community and to present goals and plans of actions to meet these needs. Some of the goals of the long-range planning were to improve the TV ministry, renovate the men's restroom, retire the roof loan, paint the exterior of the church, purchase a computer for the church office, replace the church van, renovate the Langford room, improve parking, renovate the music suite, purchase pew Bibles, and to replace the sanctuary carpet. These objectives have all been met and completed ahead of schedule and without us having to borrow any money to do it. Those who served on this committee spent many hours in study, research, and planning. Today, we express our deepest gratitude for their, their hard work. And as I call your name, if you're here, would you please stand? Pat Welch was chairperson of the committee. Deborah Watson, secretary. Barbara Presley was the typist. Other members of the committee, Harry Ho, Kyle Lynch, John McFadgen, Charles Nagel, Steve Reams, Cher Turner, and Troy Welch. Thank you. It has always been our vision, given and empowered by the Holy Spirit, that has carried us forward to this place. And today, our roots are deep and our heritage rich. And so now we turn boldly to seek God's will to discover the new vision he has for us and for our church. I know that all of you have noticed some basic changes have taken place in this place in the last few months. I would like to give you just a little history about how this came to be. At the regular business meeting, January the 15th, 1997, 
The nominating committee recommended to the church that a sanctuary rededication and capital improvement committee be elected. The nomination consisted of members of the house committee and a member representative from each adult Sunday school class. The recommendations were approved. During the committee's first meeting on February the 9th, the group discussed how to begin plans for the improvements. It was decided to divide into subcommittees, one committee being the construction committee and the other being the redecoration. It was decided to get, begin with a complete listing of all the improvements we felt were needed and to prioritize that list. As phase one, the committee felt the house on the property in the rear of the church should be removed and the parking lot paved uh, to extend the existing parking lot. This phase was completed in September. The second phase was to be the re sanctuary redecoration. So that committee began visiting other churches in the area that had recently been restored or redecorated. We visited churches in Pineville, in Barberville, in Corbin, in London, and a new building in East Bernstead. But first, some maintenance work had to be done, such as to clean and repair the woodwork, repair plaster, paint walls, paint the ends of the pews and the pulpit furniture, and replace broken spindles in the stairwells. These projects began in December. Now we began plans for the actual decoration. The carpet, which had been installed 32 years ago, needed to be replaced. The pulpit furniture, choir chairs, and pew cushions, which were purchased in 1977, needed to be refurbished or replaced. But where were we to start now? We first knew that we must decide on a color, a color that would complement our beautiful stained glass windows. After much discussion, and looking at many carpet samples, we decided on the cranberry red, which is very close to the color the carpet was before the last redecoration. The carpet would be replaced on the main floor of the sanctuary, the balcony, the stairs, and the prayer room. Flooring in the foyer would be replaced with wood using area rugs and adding a table and a bench to give a warm, welcoming feeling. Also, there were sconces added to uh, improve the lighting. The choir chairs, pulpit furniture, and pew cushions were finished in the same color as the carpet. New cloth was insta installed behind the wooden grill work and the decorative pipes. The pipes and the balcony were painted gold. Addition of new steps around the podium, raising and leveling the floor under the piano, and panels around the piano and organ completed the construction. One of the best features of the restoration is the addition of a new sound system. For those sitting in the back of the auditorium should be able to hear just as well as those sitting in the front of the auditorium. To be included in this phase is the replacement of the front doors and replacement of the grill work for the radiators. These have been ordered but have not come in at this time. In the midst of phase two, in order to utilize resources already in the building, some restrooms were upgraded, some additional plaster repair and painting done, and some wiring was improved. With the completion of phase two, the committee will now begin plans for a proposed phase three, which consists of repairing of the front steps, conversion of a heating system, improved entrance and awning for the education building, and a new entrance at the back of the church with a breezeway from the Baraka, Baraka building to the sanctuary, making access for wheelchair and handicapped easier. There also will be additional restrooms equipped for the handicapped. With the increased use of the rear parking lot, these entrances are used much more 
than they ever had been in the past. And so we felt they should be just as attractive as the front of the church. The committee is very pleased at the work that has been done, and we hope that all the church members are happy as well. Phase one and phase two have been completed without any indebtedness to the church. Our hope is that with our continual faithful giving, phase three can also be completed without any debts. Thank you, Sarah. If you're here and you are part of the Capital Improvement Committee, would you stand so we could honor you? All those who are part of the Capital Improvement and Redecoration Committee, would you stand? See those around you. We appreciate the hard work that they have also done. Join me now for our litany of dedication that you find on the inside of your bulletin. O oh God, we come this day with thankful hearts. We bring to you the result of our prayers, plans, and labors. We stand today as a people who are constantly becoming. For 109 years we have been in process. We have journeyed with you, our God. There have been times of trials and celebrations. There have been moments of despair and joy. We stand on the foundation of those who have gone before us. We are watchmen in the tower, daring to look to the past for guidance and to the future for hope. We today rededicate this beautiful building to God. In this place, you have changed our lives. Here we have been renewed week to week, year to year, and from one generation to another. In this place, we have grieved the loss of those we loved and celebrated the joining of husbands and wives. Here we have rejoiced as parents have dedicated to you their most precious gift, their children. Lord, our God, this is your sanctuary and not ours. This is holy ground because here is where we worship you. We ask you to bless this place and your church which gathers here. May this place continue to be a place where God's spirit is encountered and God's voice is heard. Let's pray together. Our eternal God, although we are a small piece of your kingdom, Although your kingdom reaches around this world and covers all that we know and understand, we still, Lord, know that we are your people and that you care for us and you care for what we do in your name. And today, Lord, we dedicate this place where we worship. Although we are very aware that this is just mortar and brick and that the true church sits in the pews, we still call this a holy place because here we encounter you week after week as you join your church that gathers here. So Lord, use this place. Let us not become prideful, but let it become our tool for worship and ministry in this community. And may it be a place where people look to and say that is where God's people gather. In Jesus' name.
stand together and sing our offertory hymn 146 oh how he loves you and me please stand
blessings that you give us. We thank you for the health and strength to assemble here today and worship you where we can be encouraged by the fellowship with fellow Christians. We ask that as we enter this time where we give our offerings to you, that we're reminded of the great sacrifice that you gave to us and that we will commit ourselves to you with our service, our love, and we ask that you'll help us become lights to our community, that other people, when they see us, will know the love of God. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Sons are a heritage from the Lord, children a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their enemies in the gate.
come here this day to proclaim that this is the Lord's house and not ours. It's an act of submission and it's an act of faith. We come here this day to look at this building that was imagined by human mind, that was produced by human labor, that was paid for by the tithes and offerings of God's people, and to say this is a wonderful work of God. It's a holy place. It's not a holy place because we can lock God in these, well, there's really not four walls, there's about ten of them, but lock him in all of these walls. But it's holy because it's construction and it's maintenance and everything that is done here is done because we come to this place to worship God. It's really a sanctuary. It's a sanctified place. It's our rocks piled on top of each other. They're a little more beautiful than rocks on top of each other on the bank of the Jordan after the Israelites had crossed over or on top of Mount Horeb where they worshiped in the high altars and places. Our rocks piled on top of each other may look a little nicer, but it's still just an altar, a place, a place where we come and we meet God. And so we come this day to consider what this place means to First Baptist Church. I know that this is not the church. We are very aware that the church is flesh and blood. It's you and it's me and those who gather in this place. But let's be honest. It's hard for us not to hear the word church and think of these big white columns out front or these pipes to my right and left or the pews in which you sit or the ornate woodwork. It reminds us of where we meet and where we gather. We are the church. We are reminded in this beautiful place as we think about this building that we stand on the shoulders of others who've gone before us. Every time I hear the history of this church recounted, I'm amazed that I can be a part of something that big. And those who went before us were people with grand vision those individuals who decided to build this sanctuary were people who decided when we're going to do something for God, we're going to do it right. They were not satisfied with just having any old meeting house to worship the Lord. And so they imagined and constructed this incredible building as a way of saying God is important in our lives. Can you imagine at that time the sacrifices that were made in family budgets to give and build this sanctuary. In our history, it says that this was the most imposing building anywhere in southeast Kentucky. And I will tell you that I've been to many of the towns where churches are in southeast Kentucky, and I am a little biased, but I still think it's the most imposing building in southeast Kentucky. It's unique. When our committee went and looked at all those other churches, we said, gosh, those are beautiful places. But we came back and looked at this place, and we said, we have a lot more to work with. So we come this day to celebration to contemplation. To think about what it means to be a part of this church and this building and this accomplishment that we have come to. We have to think about what it means to be God's people at this moment in the life of First Baptist Church. And we hear this scripture that comes down through the centuries that we've heard over and over again. Unless the Lord builds the house, its laborers labor in vain. The psalmist makes two assumptions about the Lord building the house. That first assumption is that God is at work. Unless the Lord builds the house implies that God is at work. And from scripture we know that God is at work. And he is a work among us even now. What type of work does God do? Well, first of all, he does creative work. We know that from the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And all that we see and all that we experience has been the created act of God. But God does not stop with just the simple creating or putting into the motion of the universe. But he keeps on creating because that's part of his character. He created a covenant people in the nation of Israel who were to be his witness and to be his people in covenant upon this earth. And then he created a new people, you and me, his church, through Jesus Christ. We have been created to be God's people and bring witness to God. God wants a people 
who will follow his will. God wants a people who will be his witness in this city and all over the world, and God created such a people. God creates you and me individually. The scripture attests that we are knitted together in our mother's womb. God does the work of redemption, that through Jesus Christ, God has redeemed you and me. He's bought us back from our sin. God is at work in reconciliation. He's continually reconciling the world to himself. God is continually at work maturing his people. That is, God wants us to become who he, all that we can be, and he brings good out of our bad situations, and we mature as his people. The New Testament is full of references to God's work. Jesus said in John 5, My Father is always at work, even unto this day, and I too am working. Paul described you and me as God's workmanship, created for good works in Christ. We are God's workmanship. God is working in our midst. And what I find for our church in the midst of these scriptures is this one wonderful truth that God is not through with First Baptist Church. We come to this wonderful day of accomplishment that has come 109 years, and in this particular project, over almost a decade in making. And we come to this place and we attest, this is a wonderful accomplishment, but this is not the end. I know some of you get frustrated with me. I know some of you wish that I could just enjoy the ride and relax a little bit. But it's hard for me to do that for several reasons, but let me give you one good one. One good one is because when I come on Sunday morning and I look out and I see all of your faces, I see the great possibilities of God. I still believe, like I did five years ago, that this church can be more than just another church on a corner in a city. That we have the gifts and the blessings to be something unique and wonderful in the name of God. And so I can't just relax and enjoy the ride. For the scripture tells us that God's continually at work. Unless the Lord builds the house is the assumption that we're not done yet. We're on a process. We're on a journey together and God's continually working with us. And we work alongside God. That's the second assumption that the psalmist makes. He says unless the Lord builds the house, uh, God is at work and we are dependent upon God. The word unless implies dependence. And the psalm, psalmist gives us three activities that men and women uh, participate in that become vain unless the Lord is at the center of them. Look at them just a moment. Unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. Now that word house can mean many things. It can mean your home, your structural home that you live in. It can mean your family. That is, the Lord builds your family. It can mean the Lord's temple or the Lord's house, and we would interpret that for us today as the church. Now think about that for a moment, those three items of our lives. Our home represents really our largest investment. It represents what we do with our money. It represents how we understand wealth and God's blessing in our life. And the scripture says, unless the Lord builds the house, that is, unless God's at the center of what you do with financial blessing and with your with your uh, resources, then what you do is in vain. Our families are our most precious relationships. We want healthy families and strong families, spouses who love each other, children who are brought up in the faith, parents who model Christ. And here today on Mother's Day, as we remember our mothers and our fathers who have given us the model of faith, we can affirm that this scripture is true unless the Lord builds the home, the house then we labor in vain. And our church, we want to take pride in what our church is doing and what God is doing through the church. But soon we find ourselves scurrying about, being busy, and quickly we can discover that unless the Lord God is the center of First Baptist Church, then all we do is in vain. Secondly, the psalm says, if you watch over the city, but unless God is the watchman standing guard, you stand watch in vain. We want security in our lives. Security physically, security mentally, emotionally. We want some kind of peace to live by. The world is looking for something to hang on to. I hear parents all the time frightened by this changing culture saying there's got to be something we can hang our hat on, something we can hold on to. And this psalmist says that you watch in vain. That is, you seek security 
in vain unless God is what brings you ultimate security. Thirdly, he says, in vain you rise up early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. In other words, all the activity that we do that bring, we think will bring us life will do everything but bring us life unless the Lord is at the center. Eugene Peterson writes, it makes little difference how much money Christians have in their wallets or purses. It makes little difference how our culture values and rewards our work unless the Lord builds the house. For our work neither creates life nor righteousness unless the Lord builds the house. What this psalmist wants us to understand is the simple activities of having a home, of having a family, of participating in the church. All those type of normal everyday activities become empty unless we are dependent upon God. So what does this say to us as First Baptist Church this morning in this historic time in our lives? In her book, The Preaching Life, Barbara Brown Taylor, one of America's premier preachers, talks about going on a little excursion to Turkey. She goes to that region and she tells a little of its history. In the 11th and 12th century, this was a wonderful, financially stable, progressive place and a Christian place. They brought from Constantinople all types of artisans and builders who came and erected big cathedrals and public buildings, and it was one of the centers of Christianity in the 11th and 12th century. But marauding tribes came through that area and destroyed all of those buildings, and that culture fell from Christianity, and then within 200 years, all of that work was about all gone. She tells a story of walking through a wilderness one day with her guide, and in the middle of this jungle, they came upon this huge stone cathedral in ruins. The roof had caved in. Campfires had been set inside the cathedral. Stones had been stolen and used for other buildings. And she said as they walked into the ruins of that cathedral, they looked around, and they could still see shadows of carvings of biblical scenes on the wall. And she writes this. It's one thing to talk about the post-Christian era, and it's quite another to walk around in the midst of it. Christianity died in Turkey, the land that gave us Paul, the land of the Ephesians, the Galatians, and the Colossians, now has less than 1% of Christians. The last Christians were a group of Armenian Baptists in the 1800s. Churches that once were jewels have been stripped of altars, fonts, and crosses. Some are mosques, some are museums, and others are just simply rotting. Now I want you to do something that may be difficult for some of you. I want you to imagine this beautiful building in such disrepair. I want you to imagine coming back 200 years from now, and if the building even exists, what it might look like ceiling caved in, windows shot out, pews destroyed, carpet ruined, wood rotting, nothing really left. Is that something that's possible? Dr. Taylor writes, God has given us good news in human form and has even given us the grace to proclaim it. But part of our terrible freedom is the freedom to lose our voices to forget where we are going and why. If we do not attend to God's presence in the midst and bring all of our gifts to serving that presence in our world, we may find ourselves selling tickets to a museum unless the Lord builds the house. Am I an alarmist? I don't think so. I know too many congregations. I keep up with them. I know where they're at. I know these cities and these pastors who are struggling where once vibrant churches came and worshipped. Just a decade ago, I heard of a church that I actually talked to about being their pastor, but I was too young for them, they said. They had about two or 300 people. I noticed they were running an ad the other day looking for a pastor again. A friend of mine told me they're down to 80 or 90 thinking about merging with another congregation just doesn't take very long. 
one decade of not attending to what God wants us to do can leave us in disrepair. Would it not be a shame that 200 years from now, people in Middlesbrough were going over there on 23rd Street? That's where First Baptist used to be and used to meet. Nancy Ammerman, a Baptist sociologist, wrote an article this week in the Western Recorder about, an, about some uh, gathering of information of churches in 1992, and they studied them. And she said, unless churches are willing to change and look at their ministry, then in 20 years, 70% of the churches they have studied will not exist. That's a frightening comment. So why do I push us as a congregation? Why do I refuse for us to be content? I will tell you real plainly. Because first of all, I respect those who've gone before us. And I love those babies in the nursery. And I am unwilling as your pastor to let this church decline ever again if I have anything to do with it. So here we are in this beautiful place on this historic day and I'm asking you to do something more than you really came prepared to do. To do more than rededicate this sanctuary. I'm asking you this morning to rededicate the church. You. Me. For in us, in human body, in our temple, this is the temple of God that dwells within us. So I ask you today, this time, as we've already rededicated this beautiful work and sanctuary, Will you as the church also rededicate yourself that 109 years from now another pastor can stand in this pulpit and say what they did back at the turn of the century meant that we can now continue to be God's people. It begins with your step of faith. For unless the Lord builds the house, let's pray. Lord God, we come to you this day and we know that you love us and that you love this church. For over a century, you have enabled it to grow and minister. You have brought people into the kingdom through its ministries. And Lord God, we know that in your future, there is a great awakening for us and a great opportunity for us. And so Lord, today, in the midst of all the other demands upon our lives we discover that there is a great command and a great demand to follow you help us Lord to put you at the center of all that we do for we realize today that not only in church life but in our family life and in our business and in all that we do unless you are building the house unless you are at the center we labor in vain we do not want our lives to be vain we want our lives to count, and we want them to count as individuals and as a group of followers, and we want them to be a blessing to you and to others. And so in this moment, we come to rededicate ourselves to the kingdom of God, to our walk with you, and to the work of this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of response is number 300, Without Him. Here this morning you've never accepted Christ I ask you to put him first in your life maybe you're here with your mother and she's been praying for you for years upon years what a wonderful Mother's Day present to come forward and say I want to follow Christ others are here today and you're a part of this church and you may want to come and say I want to be a part of rededicating my life to serve God in this place so that we can continue to move forward as a people if you choose to do that, I'll be at the front as you come. Others today may want to say, this is where I want to be. I want to be a part of this place that has stood for Christ for over a century and that wants to continue to serve him in the next century. If that's your decision, we open our arms to you and our doors to you. I'll be at the front as you come. Let's stand and sing.
been a wonderful day to be in the church and to have fellowship with you and with each other and to worship our Lord God. We celebrate today as a people of God what God has done and particularly what God has done the past few years here as we've worshiped together and, and the completion of this project. We are just so excited about that and look forward to what God is going to continue to do beyond buildings and beyond capital improvements but in the lives of his people in this place. And so I appreciate those who've come forward and, and said publicly, we love this place, we love this church, and we want to continue to serve him here. And I know many feel that in their heart today. So as we leave here, let's commit ourselves during our benediction. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we leave this place, we have been renewed. We have been challenged to follow you. And so as we leave this place and we become the real church scattered in this city, may people know of your love because of the love that we show. May they know of the gospel of good news because we proclaim it and we live it. May this community know that this place houses God's people who seek to serve him with all of their heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. It certainly is a perfect day to worship our Lord. But before we worship, I'd like to highlight a few announcements for you. If you would look in your bulletin, uh, you'll see an announcement about our FBC website. This is a website that we've had up and running for uh, a while now, and one of our members is very diligent about keeping it updated and current. And uh, I just I find it very informative and very interesting. And it also, uh, if you would check out the website, it would give you the opportunity to email some of. Uh, your fellow church members. So I just want to encourage you to check out our uh, FBC website and you'll find the address there in the bulletin. Uh, we have a softball game this week at 7.45 p.m. Uh, if you are going to play, uh, please be at the church by 6.45. Also, uh, tomorrow is the Big Brotherhood Fish Fry. Uh, men, come to the fish fry. I don't even like fish, but I, but I really don't. <laughs> But I love their fish. They do something to it. That the way they fry it, it's really good. And uh, Tony, is gonna, Tony Gilbert is going to be uh, our guest speaker, and I know a lot of you will be looking forward to hearing him. So uh, please come to the fish fry. 
We'd like to welcome our guests who are with us this morning. Uh, if you are visiting, we'd like to ask that you take time to fill out the uh, card, which you'll find attached to your bulletin, and place that in the offering plate. Members and frequent attenders, please make these guests feel welcome uh, as we stand and greet each other during our fellowship time. this morning God's word as we come to worship it is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name O most high to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten stringed lyre and the melody of the harp for you make me glad by your deeds O Lord I sing for joy at the works of your hands how great are your works O Lord how profound are your thoughts the senseless man does not know fools do not understand that though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will be forever destroyed. But you, O Lord, are exalted forever. Let's stand together and sing our hymn of praise. We have come into this house, number 361. Please stand. we pray together this morning, I want to announce to you who you elected to be our nominating committee, and I want to do that for a reason, because I want us to have special prayer for those five this morning. It's one of your staff's goals to involve all of the church in ministry, and we're trying to do that year after year to 
expand our outreach to people in the church who maybe have just been marginal in their attendance or marginal in their service and to give them opportunities to use their gifts. And these five individuals who you have chosen will be a part of that process this coming year. I'm going to call their names and I'm going to just ask you to stand this morning. Gene Osmus, Chalk Stapleton, Wade Bevins, Dewey Parton, and Tony Daniels. These are who you've elected to serve you, and we're going to have prayer for them this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. God, we come to you this day with grateful hearts for what you're doing in our midst, how you've called us to be your people, how you've gifted us individually, and have brought us into this fellowship to glorify your name. Lord, today we pray for these five whom the church has called from themselves to serve you in a special way. We pray that you would give them wisdom as they go about the task of matching ministries and gifts in this church. We pray for those in our church who have gifts that are unused, and we pray that this year would be the time that they would make commitment to use their gifts and abilities to glorify you, to strengthen this fellowship. We pray for those who are using their gifts and who are tired and, Lord, who find themselves dejected. And we pray today that you might give them a new strength. May they rise up as eagles even this day and find strength in your spirit and today renew themselves in their commitment to serving you. We thank you, Lord, because you have called us to serve you. We are not worthy of that calling, but by your grace alone you have called us to this task to minister to people, to share the gospel, to strengthen your church. And so, Lord, as we approach this new year, we pray, Lord, that you will help us to all come together with our gifts and use them for your glory. And we pray in unison the prayer you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Boy. 
sunshine, oh, abide with me. Scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Let's join together singing now and sing a medley of strong Christian hymns that re reflect and express our commitment to Christ and our Christian walk. We'll start with hymn 483. We'll sing the next three consecutive hymns, one verse of each. Please stand.
shall we pray? Lord, we call up on you for many things, but sometimes we're not thankful for the ones we receive. Bless this nation of ours, our state, our country, because we can worship as we please, dear Lord. Bless these tithes and offerings that you're about to receive in your blessed name, we pray.
Well, those are famous last words. We use that phrase sometimes when someone says something that we think will never be fulfilled or a promise is made that we know is going to be broken. See if you've used some of these phrases before. I'll take care of it. That will never happen to me. I wouldn't be caught dead doing that. Well, what about those wonderful promises we make? And I guess adults make these promises, but especially I remember making such promises at camp or your week at the beach when you're a teenager. I'll never forget you. <laughs> I'll write. <laughs> Let me write that in. I'll give you a call. I'll love you forever. I'll be back. Sadly, we do that in the church. How many times have you said this, and it's a famous last word, I'll be praying for you, never really intending to pray for that person. What about famous last words from politics? Well, there's the one that transcends all decades, and that is, I'll stand up for the little man. Or there's the 80s version, read my lips, no new taxes. In the 70s, we had, I am not a crook. And of course, the 40s gave us Dewey wins. We should have some older people that remember that one now. All the younger ones, Jack had no idea what that was about when I, said, when I told him that. No. <laughs> we can all think of phrases like that, famous last words that were unfulfilled. But we can also think of famous last words that have great meaning and purpose. Words from the cross, like, it is finished. Or Jesus' words from the ascension. Go ye therefore and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. The Apostle Paul had a lot of famous last words. When he wrote to the churches to whom he ministered to and to whom he had founded, he left them with words at the end of his letters that seemed to bring everything back to focus on the things that they needed to deal with and how they could grow as Christians. And we find such words in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be of one mind and live in peace. Famous last words that are good words. Good words to the church at Corinth and good words to First Baptist Church Middlesbrough. Good words to you and me as individuals. They're good words because they speak of growing spiritually. They speak of becoming complete in Christ. Paul begins this verse with brothers, finally brothers, farewell, or finally brothers, goodbye. But a better translation for such a verse is simply this. Now these things remain. Now these things remain. Paul had said, after all I've taught you, after all I've written to you, there are still some things in your life that remain incomplete, still some places in your relationship with Christ that need to grow. You still have a way to go. These things remain. And when I think about us as a church and us as individuals, I think that we can hear that word this morning. These things remain. There are parts of our lives that are undone. Week after week we come and we hear God's word from the pulpit or in Sunday school classes. For years upon years we've come and we've learned what it means to be a Christian and yet when we look at our lives we realize there are still some things that are undone. And Paul lists three of those. Three things that if we'll give ourselves to we can grow spiritually as individuals and as a church. Let's look at them for just a moment. First Paul says aim for perfection. My translation, have intentional discipleship. Intentional discipleship. One of the great problems with the church at Corinth is that in the church of Corinth, they had converted many Gentiles to Christianity. And when the Gentile looked at choosing between Judaism and Christianity, many times they chose Christianity. And here is why. Judaism was saying, here is a group of laws and codes that you must keep if you're going to be a fine Jew. And Christians were talking about freedom in Christ. And so the Gentiles saw that as something that was pleasing to them, and they chose freedom in Christ. But they misunderstood that freedom. 
They thought freedom in Christ meant that they could continue with the same lifestyle after they accepted Christ as they had lived before they accepted Christ. And because of that, there was a great libertine movement in the church at Corinth. They saw no relation between their faith and work, faith and family, faith and ethics, faith and business. Their life was the same after Christ as it was before Christ. We find some examples of that in Paul's letters to the church at Corinth. One in particular comes at 1 Corinthians 5th uh, chapter where he talks about this sexual immorality that's in the church. And in the church at Corinth, there was a man, and Paul says there was a man doing something that the pagans would not even do. They would not even occur in a pagan culture. He had his father's wife. And so Paul was saying to the church at Corinth, not only are there people in your church who are Christians and they are doing things that non-Christians are doing, but even worse than that, there are some in your church who are doing things that the pagans would not even do. They would look down upon it. But the church was unwilling to offend this brother and so they were letting him go on in his sin, afraid to approach him in reconciliation and love and say, God has a better plan for your life. Not only were they not willing to do that, but they were boasting of their tolerance of the situation. And so Paul says to them, aim for perfection. In other occasions, there were lawsuits between brothers and sisters in Christ. They were not treating each other like Christ had taught them to treat one another. And so the lesson we learn is simple, that there were those within the church at Corinth who acted immoral and even more immoral than those outside the church. I wish I could tell you today that in the 20th century and the 21st century to come, church, we've learned our lesson. But the reality is that we still struggle with being different after Christ than we were before Christ. There's some alarming statistics that come from the Barna Polling Agency that's a Christian polling agency. It tells us some things like this. With teenagers, it tells us that if you're a Christian profess to be a Christian as a teenager, there seems to be no relationship between that and premarital sexual activity. You cannot tell the non-Christian from the Christian when you talk about being sexually active before marriage. In college students, those who profess Christ, they seem to cheat on tests just as much as the non-Christian cheats on tests. And we know that that's rampant in the academic world today. And as adult Christians, we know that there are those of us who struggle to say that we're no different than we were before Christ. In fact, sometimes we're even worse. Adult Christians quickly discover that there are instances where they are involved with such things as sexual immorality, drunkenness, marriage infidelity, business ethics is a big problem in Christian life. What's missing? How come you and I who profess Christian, Christianity and profess Christ are sometimes no different than those who reject Christ. I think it's this first admonition from Paul, intentional discipleship. Aim for perfection. Aim means be intentional about what you do when it comes to your faith. What would you think of a hunter who went out into the woods and said, I never really take aim at anything. I just get out there, shut my eyes, and shoot up in the air and hope I hit something. Well, obviously we'd say, I don't want to go hunting with this individual. Or what about an NBA professional who has a great shot percentage and you say, how do you make all those shots? He says, I don't know, I just shut my eyes and sling the thing towards the basket. We'd say, you're ridiculous. That's crazy. And yet as Christians, we live like that. Most Christians do not pray every day. Most Christians do not read the Bible every day. Most Christians cannot be found in God's house for worship on Sunday. And then we wonder why we lack the power to be different than we were before we came to Christ. Paul says, aim at perfection. And we shy away from that word perfection because that's our big excuse. Look, I'm only human. I can't be perfect. And yet Jesus said we are to be perfect even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And Paul says, aim for perfection. The word doesn't mean to be without sin because we cannot be without sin. The word means to be complete, fulfilled, doing what God has created you to do. One translator says, work your way onwards toward completion. 
So the question comes, how are you and I in the matter of aiming for perfection? As we look at our lives, are we farther from Christ or are we growing closer to Christ? Some of us think we can stay status quo, but really I've never seen a Christian who can do that. They're either growing in Christ-likeness or they're falling away from Christ. And Paul says to the church at Corinth and to you and me, aim for perfection. Be intentional in your discipleship. That is, place yourself in a situation where you can grow in Christ. Be a part of Bible study. Be a part of worship. Be a part of using your gifts because only then can God use you, use you and let you grow. Secondly, Paul says, listen to my appeal. Listen to my words. To be spiritually mature as a Christian, as a church, we need to be willing to be open to teaching. The Corinth church was bombarded with all types of teaching. False prophets and good-meaning leaders. They had several pastors that had divided them because one wanted one pastor's teaching and one wanted another. And Paul says to them, you listen to my appeal. That is, as Christians, we've got to come to a place, and this is a very basic thing, to being willing to learn and to grow. The Apostle Paul said to the church at Corinth that many of them had become arrogant and prideful in their faith. In other words, they got to the point and they said, I have nothing else to learn. How many times do we arrive at such a place in our faith? We have to be willing to be open, to be open to teaching from the pulpit, to be open from teaching from good Bible leaders in Sunday school, to be open to being taught by one another, to be taught by our children and by our youth and what they can teach us, and by our senior adults, to all of us come together and learn from one another. I got a great quote over the Internet from one of our church members this week about listening and learning and growing. It's a quote from Galileo, and he, he said, I do not feel obliged to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forgo their use. Simply put, we should be always about learning. God has given us great gifts and skills to listen to each other and to learn from one another. Paul's second admonition is listen, grow, be willing to be taught. Thirdly, Paul says, be of one mind and live in peace. That does not mean that we're all supposed to think the same, but it means we're supposed to have harmony toward the same aim and purpose. I will tell you quickly that as a church, we will not be effective unless there's harmony. You can have gifted leaders, gifted lay people, great programs, fantastic facilities, but if you lack harmony in a church, you will not be effective in reaching Christ. Now, the church at Corinth was divided along many lines. Two I've already mentioned. They were divided between libertines and those who were strict in moral code and Jewish law. There were those on one side that says, to be a Christian, you've got to do this, 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 and this, and if you fall away from it, you're not a Christian. On this side, there were those who said, you don't have to do anything to be a Christian. Just believe in Christ and you can go on living as you want to. And we have those in our society who give us the same message. There are those in our society today, especially in American culture, who says if you don't vote for this person, believe this way, interpret this scripture like I tell you, you are not Christian. And then there's others who say, live life like you want it. You don't have to worry about reading the Bible. You don't even have to worry about interpreting scripture. Just be free. And there's division. There was division between the Corinthians concerning pastoral lo loyalty. Some wanted to follow Apollos and his teachings. Some wanted to follow Paul and his teachings. And there are churches today who are splitting because of pastor loyalty. When I was in Nyota, we had had several people come into the church and a lot of growth in that little church. And it was, it was hard to absorb that many new people when you only start out with 70 or 80. And one uh, older deacon came to me and said, Pastor, I want to, want to tell you something. Uh, now, we love you, but we're church people. We're not pastor people. And I looked him in the eye and I said, I'll tell you what. You help me make every one of those new members church people because I don't want any pastor people. 
the church at Corinth was divided because they wanted a loyalty toward a pastor. They had forgotten whom they were serving. And there are those in our church who've never returned to church because a pastor left. We need to remember where our loyalty really lies. There was division because of worship. Now listen if this doesn't hit home. Their division included things like disagreement concerning the Lord's Supper, the role of women in the church, speaking in tongues during worship, and they were divided over worship style. I've told you before and I'll tell you again, the most volatile issue in the church today is worship style. Churches are splitting all over America, not because of theology, but because of worship style. One group wants to sing choruses and be free. and other group wants to sing hymns and tells the other group they don't know anything about being reverent. And the other group says, but you don't know anything about expressing yourself and, and feeling the Holy Spirit. And the other one says, give me the good old time religion. I don't want anything to do with that new stuff. And I'll tell you something, First Baptist Middlesboro, this will be the hardest thing we deal with in the next 10 years. We're blessed to have a person like Todd Spangler who knows how to blend worship. But if we're going to be a church for every generation and for this whole city and community, we have got to learn how to worship together and how to blend worship. It's essential if we're going to make it. The church at Corinth was also divided about some serious matters, theological debate. Some doubted the resurrection of the dead, and that's a serious theological matter, and they were divided at that point. So when we look at the church of Corinth, we find all the issues that divide us today. We find the result of politics in the church, a struggle for power within the church and following certain leaders. We find the struggle of cultural issues such as worship and women's role in ministry. And we find theological debate. And we quickly discover that Paul was saying to a church that was so divided, be of one mind and live in peace. Now be of one mind does not mean everybody think the same and look the same. Christ does not produce mass-produced Christians. The scripture is full of people who are so different that God used in different ways. We're not just supposed to think the same and have all the same gifts, but we are supposed to have the same aim and purpose. I've asked Todd to help illustrate this last point this morning. Todd, will you help me? I would do it myself, but it'd be a real mess. Some people think that what it means to be the church it's for everyone to be in unison. Everyone to think alike and, and uh, have the same theology, have, use to have the same gifts. Everyone just be exactly alike. If that was the case, this is the sound that the world would hear from our church. pretty. That's a discernible message. Everyone would be able to know what we're about. But look what could happen if we said, you know what, being in, being in one mind doesn't mean everyone being alike. It means we all bring our gifts and we come together and we work together to bring a glorious melody to our community. What would it sound like then? bring all our gifts, and work together. And as long as everybody stays in their place working together and nobody does anything very creative, then that would be fine. 
But what if we grew up spiritually enough to aim for perfection, to be willing to grow, and to realize that there's something we're a part of that's greater than ourselves, and we're willing to allow God to use individuals and wonderful gifts to have the freedom to express themselves in Christ and to share Christ with others as they have been gifted? What sound would our community hear? Webster says harmony is bringing parts and putting them into agreement with each other. In the church, that means to come and discover that you are a part of something much greater than yourself. To grow spiritually, we need to hear these famous words. These things remain. Have an intentional discipleship. Aim for perfection. Be willing to grow. Listen to each other and to teaching. Be a part of something greater than yourself. For when you and I become as one mind and we live at peace, we produce an incredible melody that all the world wants to hear. And we come together and we produce the most beautiful and lasting work that the world will ever know. Those are some famous last words. Let's pray together. Lord God, what a calling you have given to us to be people who are always on a journey of faith, to be a people who are always growing in Christ's likeness, to be a people who do not have to walk alone. And we thank you, Lord, for the church and the fellowship of the church. And we thank you for the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that walks with us. And I pray today that as individuals and as a church, we might begin again the process of growing, maturing, becoming holy, becoming Christ-like. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of response this morning is 492, Pure in Heart, O God. As you turn there this morning, let me issue the invitation I issue to you each week. And that is, if you've never accepted Christ, today is the day to do that. To begin this journey we've been talking about. To make that movement to become Christ-like. And let Christ change you by forgiving you of your sins and giving you a new life. Others who are here today, maybe where you're at or maybe publicly, you want to say... I want to aim for perfection. I want to be more intentional about my faith. Today, you make that recommitment. Still others say, what I need is a fellowship for me to use my gifts. I want to be a part of that beautiful sound that comes from this congregation. You come and become a part of this congregation if God is leading you to that decision. And I'll be at the front as you come. Let's stand and sing.
not forget our Wednesday night activities. We are no longer having activities on Sunday evening as we had in the summer, but our Wednesday night activities continue for all ages, and we're doing Bible study on the Ascent Psalms that we're about halfway through with, so we encourage you to be a part of that. Next Sunday is going to be a wonderful Sunday in the life of our church. It is our annual graduate day. And we have several who are graduating from high school. We're going to honor them and also honor some of our college graduates. Uh, Reverend McClellan will be bringing our message. And if you've never heard Jack preach, I'm telling you, uh, you'd probably want to fire me. That's the way I feel about it. Uh, he's a great preacher. And you'll enjoy hearing him preach next week. I'm looking forward to being able to sit and listen next week and hear Jack bring the message. So be praying for Jack this week and also for our graduate day. We're going to close our service this morning by singing the chorus which we began our worship with, How Majestic Is Your Name, Fellowship Chorus number 29.